you have probably faced transistors that claim to switch high currents, right? The vendor might say that a certain transistor can switch up to 100 amperes, or it might be written in the datasheet that this certain part number can switch 200 amperes. You might be surprised or even disbelieved it. For example, this IGBT with part number 30G124, according to the claims in some part seller websites and also written in the datasheet, should be able to switch up to 200 amperes. I have no idea if you really believe this number from bottom of your heart or not. If you have doubts about this number or you think that these numbers are just lies, I have to say that you are not alone. Many people don't believe it because these numbers are not correct in fact. And the power of the parts like this one is much less than the numbers like 200 amperes. But it's interesting to know that many people, even professionals, don't have accurate information in this regard. In this video, I want to talk about it and clear up some ambiguities once and for all whether a tiny component with relatively thin pins like this IGBT can really switch 200 amperes or not and if it can, then what is the real power of the components like this one? To start, I think the best thing is to go to the datasheet first to see if it is really written in the datasheet that this IGBT can switch up to 200 amperes or if the online stores have written something wrong. After all, we consider the datasheet as a reliable source for getting information about parts. This is the datasheet for 30G124 IGBT. If we take a look at page 4, we can see that a table of basic specifications of this part is given here. Since our desired part is in the TO220 SIS package, like this one, we have to look for that part in this column somewhere here. Look, here it is. GT30G124 is mentioned here. If you look carefully, you can see that 430 volts is written here in the breakdown voltage column, which means that this part can switch DC loads up to 430 volts. If you look carefully at the adjacent column here, uh, it is related to the current of the part. Look, yes, 200 is written here and their unit is written here as amperes so far what is written on the online stores is correct okay it's correct that 200 amperes is written in the datasheet but does this mean that we can actually draw 200 amperes from it in reality yes yes we can but it has conditions usually when we talk about the current of parts like transistors we mean how much current we can draw from the part steadily and continuously but these 200 amperes written in the datasheet does not mean that. If you ask why, I have to show the answer on the datasheet. 200 amperes is written here. Correct. It is written in the current column. This is also correct. But if you look carefully, you can see that the current column here actually has two segments. The first one is related to the continuous current of the part which mentioned as DC, and the second one is mentioned as pulse, which means the instantaneous current. This 200 amperes is written in the instantaneous current segment. So far, it has been determined that this part can switch up to 200 amperes of current, but only for a very short moment, right? If you want to draw 200 amperes from this part for a longer period, even for a few seconds, for example, it will definitely be damaged or even explode. Here, you might wonder how much my short moment means. That is, how long is this 200 amper tolerable for this part? To find the answer to this question, we have to refer to the datasheet again and review it carefully to see if there is anything written in the datasheet about the current pulse duration or not. I looked for the pulse duration parameter in the datasheet and finally found it. Here on the page 12. Here on page 12, there are several tables that write the power of the parts. For example, look. 
uh, for GT30 F131, it gives 140 watts, and for GT30 G124, it gives 25 watts. I don't care about the power of the parts for now. What is important to me is the number written here. Look. Here again, 200 amperes is written, but if you look carefully at the top, it says ICP at 3 microseconds. I believe the factory determines here what it means by a 200 amperes pulse. That is, if we want to draw 200 amperes of current from this part, we can only do this for 3 microseconds, and more than 3 microseconds will damage the part. When we talk about the current of parts like transistors or IGBTs, we usually don't mean a 3 microsecond pulse, right? In fact, we mean the other column where a smaller number is written which is related to the continuous current of the part. As far as I remember, nothing was written there for this guy. That's right. For this part number, the amount of current that it can switch continuously is not written here. Probably the amount of steady state current for these part numbers listed here depends on many conditions and parameters, so they couldn't write a specific number here. Let's make an estimate ourselves. Although this is not very principled and reliable, but if you look carefully, you can see that for other parts, it can be said that the continuous current was almost half of the instantaneous current. For example, here it was 20 amperes, it became 10 amperes. Or uh, here it was 120 amperes, it became 60 amperes. Of course, there are exceptions. For example, here was 100 amperes for instantaneous current, it became 30 amperes. Now, if we want to make an estimate, I say that for 30G124, if we consider the same coefficient, we should say that it can probably switch about 100 amperes continuously. I said before, I emphasize again that the calculation we did and divided 200 amperes by 2 and got the number 100 amperes is not principled. But let's assume that this number 100 amperes is correct. It is true that we didn't accept 200 amperes and reach the number 100 amperes, which is much less than 200 amperes, but this number 100 ampere itself is still very high and it is not the number we were looking for. So I think there must be something in between. Let's review the datasheet together again to see if another point can be found or not. If we look carefully, we can see that here on the current column or the voltage column, it says at Ta equal to 25 degrees Celsius. That is, for the numbers mentioned in the current or voltage columns here, the temperature conditions are also considered. The meaning is that if we can keep the ambient temperature around the component at 25 degrees Celsius, these numbers are valid, otherwise these numbers are invalid. Remember that the current that the part can switch is definitely less at high temperatures than when the part's temperature is lower. Note that it says Ta here, which means the ambient temperature. If it wrote Tc, the situation would be worse because Ta is the ambient temperature, but the Tc is the temperature of the part surface itself. Now it is a little more believable. First we said 200 amperes, then we saw that this number is only valid for a very short moment. So we brought it down to 100 amperes. Then we reached the temperature conditions which also limits the current a bit. Now for example, let's assume that if we don't consider the temperature conditions. Since we know that unfavorable temperature conditions causes the parts performance to drop, we say that, for example, the real amount of current that this part can switch in real conditions is definitely less than 100 amperes, right? Of course, our work doesn't end here. We can review the datasheet more to see if there is anything else that can help us to get more realistic numbers that we can refer to with confidence or not. When I reviewed the datasheet a little more, I came across this graph on page 5. 
Look here, this graph shows the relation between the collector current and the collector emitter voltage. The collector current is the current that flows from the collector to emitter and in fact it is the parameter that we are looking for to see what its maximum amount can be. The collector emitter voltage is also the voltage that drops on this junction when the component is turned on. To be able to review this graph better here, I printed the graph itself on another page so that we can see more details together. There are four curves in this graph and these two curves are related to the MOSFET inside the IGBT. You must know that inside an IGBT there is both a MOSFET and a power transistor of a BJT type. I don't care about the internal structure of the IGBT in this video and also these two curves that are related to the MOSFET and have low power because their effect on our subject is negligible. What I have to consider are these two curves that are very similar and are drawn for different temperature conditions. The one that is drawn with the dashed line, I mean this one, is for the temperature 125 degrees Celsius and the other one, I mean this one, is for the temperature 25 degrees Celsius. What is clear here is that with the increase in the current that we draw from the collector, the voltage at the collector emitter also increases. Since the transistor's power dissipation is obtained from the product of the collector current and the collector emitter voltage, we see that with increase in the collector current, the transistor's power dissipation also increases. Previously, in one of the tables that we reviewed in the datasheet, we saw that for each part, a specific power dissipation is written in the datasheet, right? Do you remember that? For example, for this guy, the 30G124 IGBT, the maximum power dissipation was, I think, 25 watts, if I remember correctly. It is definitely illogical not to bring this 25 watts into our calculations. I'm going to consider the point A in this graph. Here, the collector emitter voltage is approximately 1.3 volts and the collector current is 20 amperes. That is, if we draw 20 amperes of current, the collector emitter voltage becomes 1.3 volts and at this point, the power dissipation becomes 26 watts, which is more than 25 watts the maximum power dissipation of the component. Here it can be concluded that for this IGBT we can switch up to 20 amperes by considering the temperature conditions and power dissipation and that 200 ampere number can be a bit misleading. That is, those friends who adopted the numbers, for example 200 amperes, were somewhat right. Okay, my friend, we have reached the end of the line. I hope this video has been useful for you and you have enjoyed it and learned something new. If you enjoyed watching this video, be sure to like it and subscribe to my channel. Anyway, thanks for being with me. Thanks for watching me. Until the next video, take care and have a good one.